second. So I'd like to say we have a, a great organization made up of internationalists. Um, so today's session should be quite good because um, we'll be looking at how the world would look like in a post-globalization world. So uh, let me introduce Simon Turner. He ha ha is the new chapter leader for, for uh, Boston. So for those of you who haven't met Simon, Simon also serves as the treasurer for the IERG. And so it's, uh, it's gonna be spread quite thin, I think. But this is fantastic. Thank you for stepping up, Simon. So Simon, maybe you can uh, introduce Andrew. Will do. Uh, thank you, everyone. Welcome to this Boston chapter meeting. Uh, given the global uh, topic, uh, we felt it would be great to open this up to, uh, to um, other chapters um, and some guests outside of IRG. Um, so I'd like to introduce our, our guest today, and Andrew. Uh, Andrew is partner in Bain and Company's New York office. Uh, he's a member of Bain's America's Financial Services practice, which he's led for six years, as well as the organization practice. Um, he's also co-chair of the Bain Insights Group, which analyzes global, e global economic and other trends for the firm's clients. So, Andrew, at this point, I'd like to hand over to you. All right. Thank you, uh, Simon and, and Wasim, and uh, hello, everyone. Nice to be here with you all today. And, um, you know, I thought I'd spend maybe 20, 25 minutes or so walking through some of what we are seeing on this topic of post-globalization and its role in helping shape what the next decade or, or several decades may look like. And um, would love to make this interactive though. So I think we have the ability for folks to, to type questions into the chat window. I think Simon, you're gonna moderate those and we should have um, some good time for, for questions and general discussion at the end. So uh, if that sounds like a reasonable plan, um, you know, why don't we dive in? And I guess maybe just a, a little bit of context setting um, Simon mentioned our, our Bain Insights Group and, and our focus on macro trends. So one of the roles that I play at the firm is, is helping us um, try to look at and analyze major drivers of both business and non-business trends, uh, mainly with an eye towards their implication for, for businesses. Uh, and so what is the macro context in which uh, our clients are operating? And that often requires a little bit of a look back before you can look forward. Um, and I should acknowledge here right now as well that we're in a pretty pivotal time uh, with all the changes occasioned by, by COVID. And you know, I'm sure we'll talk about that today because uh, that will affect many of these trends. But the starting point for this discussion, if you take that look back, is a recognition that you know, we have come through a period of time over, you know, call it a 30, 35 year period or so, where we've all gotten used to a tremendous amount of macro stability. Uh, the great moderation, I, you know, this is not a term we coined, uh, it's a term that a lot of people would use to describe the recent decades. And it was a, a period in which many leaders, business leaders and otherwise, could kind of take as a given, uh, call it a, at a minimum benign macro context uh, or even kind of favorable macro tailwinds. And these are just some of the trends that you, that you saw during that period. Uh, you know, we had fa favorable demographics uh, in terms of a growing supply of labor, both in the US and globally. Uh, we had a, a growing supply of capital, uh, which helped drive down interest rates. Uh, there were trends towards urbanization in both developed uh, and emerging markets. And we had this huge wave of globalization, uh, you know, really going back to the, to the post-World War II era and then reaching a pivot point at the end of the Cold War, but then another phase that really ticked on for 20 or 30 years or so. So this was about as good an environment uh, as you could get in which to, to operate uh, a business uh, in general. And I think the question that we pose is, you know, what is uh, maybe changing here? What is gonna maybe continue or accelerate? And, and what will the next several decades look like? And, you know, we, we wrote this, I think, uh, to be candid before uh, all of the disturbances from COVID. Um, but I think if anything, the story is, is, is still broadly what we believe, and if anything, maybe going to just be accelerated uh, by all of the impacts from the current pandemic. You know, we said that we're going to be entering a period that we'll call the great transformation, 
Uh, and that's really going to manifest itself in the next decade, in the 2020s, and reshape uh, you know, the next three, four decades to come. And some of the big drivers that are, are shaping that new era are the end of this uh, era of supernormal labor growth. So if you look back to the World War, you know, post-World War II era, you had three major forces driving an increase in labor force growth. You had the baby boomers uh, in the US and in many other countries. You had women entering the workplace in large numbers. And you had the rise of outsourcing and offshoring and emerging markets like China and India joining the global labor force. You know, all three of those trends have, you know, at a minimum kind of plateaued uh, and in some cases are facing real challenges or reversals. Uh, you had the rise of, of automation, uh, largely in a manufacturing context. And what we're now seeing is the early innings of a major push towards service sector automation, which is one of those trends that I think will be accelerated uh, in the response to COVID. You had for probably at least the last 10 or 15 years, what we call demand constrained growth. And this is just the notion that at any given point in time in any economy, your major constraint to growth can either be on the supply side, which is where the US was 30 or 40 years ago, and where countries like Brazil and India are today, or demand constrained growth, which is where most of the rest of the developed world has been, um, and, and, and certainly where we've been kind of heading into the COVID scenario. Now we're in a period in the short term where we have had a very severe supply shock. And the question is coming out of this, uh, you know, do we resume a period of demand constrained growth or is that supply shock going to be with us uh, for a longer period of time? Uh, we talked about the declining cost of distance. So this is the idea that the cost of moving people, goods, information uh, has been going down you know, for centuries and is now going to be going down maybe at an even faster rate due to things like changes in manufacturing scale uh, from 3D printing. Um, due to things like um, the massive worldwide connectivity boom that's come with uh, telecom innovation and, and 5G, uh, and the declining law cost of last mile logistics that shows up in, in things like autonomous delivery services. So all of these trends were making it cheaper to use more distance effectively. Uh, and so all else equal, we would expect people will use more distance. And we'll talk about kind of what that, what that means. And then finally, uh, and then maybe most directly for this topic of post-globalization, we've been in a period of several decades of strong US global leadership, um, even greater after the Cold War in the last two or three decades. And that was already uh, coming to an end. Uh, it doesn't mean that America is uh, you know, gonna completely lose its leadership role, but the relative advantage it had over the rest of the world has ebbed considerably which you know, I think will unleash a lot of destabilizing effects that we can talk about. And so some of the consequences of this are um, you know, a much more volatile and turbulent financial and macroeconomic environment, uh, a massive kind of boom bust cycle uh, that we can describe over the next decade and now maybe even happening even faster as a result of COVID. Uh, this shift in developed markets to what we call post-urbanization so that a cost of distance is going down. And as a result, we see people using more distance and actually moving out of cities. When I talk about that with audiences like this, that's usually a counterintuitive notion because I think we're all used to reading about urbanization. I think what I would say here is this is still largely a trend that is happening in developing markets. But if you look at a market like the US, with the exception of a few cities, you've seen a clear shift already in the last 10, 15 years towards people dispersing and using more land and that, uh, again, is one of these that could be accelerated by the response to COVID. Uh, the role of the state in the marketplace, part of this benign environment was a generally laissez-faire attitude. And again, we see that changing and certainly the shock of the, the level of intervention uh, by, by government authorities in both fiscal and monetary policy is only going to pull forward this, this uh, era where we make it a more interventionist role uh, for the state. And then finally, a reordering of the, of the post-World War II and post-Cold War institutions. So we'll talk through those trends in a little more detail today. Um, you know, the, the, the notion that I'd like to kind of uh, leave you with here is, you know, this is not to say that the world is falling apart or we're necessarily gonna enter a new Cold War or even a hot war, uh, but just the notion that we've been in this, you know, much more benign environment and now probably the best words that I can put on this are a sense of pervasive insecurity. 
uh, which is really increasing in, in most parts of the world today. Wanted to just um, orient a little bit to this notion of the US kind of relative advantage. So if you look at three different points in time, you know, maybe the, the, the waning innings of the Cold War, the, the US um, was the leading military power in the world, had over 40% of global military spending. It was about two and a half times the, uh, at least the inputs or the investment of our nearest rival, uh, the Soviet Union. You know, uh, fast forward to 2000, maybe the absolute height of the US relative power advantage. Cold War has ended, the Soviet Union has disappeared, uh, eight times the nearest rival. Uh, and then you see this gap now starting to, uh, to converge again. Uh, this time, of course, it's not the Soviet Union, but China. And uh, these trends are, this is a 2017, you know, this picture, even in spite of US increased defense spending in recent years, is, is only likely to narrow further going forward. So the US no longer has the same absolute advantage it had at the end of the Cold War period. We also have dynamics now where for most of US history, there was a fairly strong sense of security and protection by virtue of uh, having peaceful neighbors and two large oceans. And you know there are now, I would argue, two new frontiers that are really threatening that historic position. Uh, the first is, is outer space and the second is cyberspace. So both of these are new, you can think of them as new borderlands which have diminished the natural security that the US has gotten from really favorable geography historically. And so the, the diminishing military advantage over China in particular uh, and economic advantage and China being a more formidable economic rival than the Soviets ever were, combined with this increasing ability for smaller groups of people to unleash significant amounts of destruction, especially through both space and, and cyberspace, has increased this feeling of, of insecurity in the US especially. And so the destabilization that may come in the next decade will partly be coming from emerging and, and, and growing rivals, uh, but also from the US response to those trends. Um, you know, related point to, to keep in mind here is that, you know, a lot of the institutions that we built up uh, over the post-Cold War decades and the favorable environment for economic globalization really had a political impetus for them. So it was the strategy to organize, uh, you know, as, as much of the world as the U.S. could and, and win, fight and win the Cold War that led to a, uh, you know, significant embrace of globalization, free trade, and open markets. The rationale shifted in 1990, in the early 90s, you no longer had the geopolitical imperative uh, to support globalization and free trade. But at that point, the perception was that this has been a, a productive and successful model. And so we doubled down on it. And there was an embrace of a further wave of globalization, bringing China into the, into the WTO, and a further underwriting of not just the security order, but also the economic order uh, that supported globalization. And so the rationale for globalization pivoted from primarily defense, to shared prosperity, as well as a sense that if we all invest in, in a globalized world, it will lead to a convergence on, on Western values uh, and liberalization over time, which, uh, you know, that I think was the assumption, unfortunately has not, you know, has not largely borne true. Um, and part of what I think we're now seeing, especially in the U.S., but in other developed markets, is a backlash against some of the costs that went along with underwriting that global economic and political order. Um, so this is a chart uh, that uh, some of you may, may have seen described as the elephant chart. Um, you can see why. Uh, but effectively, it looks at the global income inequality and how that has played out over um, recent decades. And, and what you effectively see here is that the rise of globalization has been a very good thing for um, people at both the top and, and, and the bottom end of the spectrum globally. So globalization has lifted uh, you know, literally billions of people out of poverty. And at the same time, uh, people at the top, the, the most successful and skilled workers in developed economies, the, the right side of the elephant's trunk, uh, have done very well also. 
Um, but the, the, the group of people that has not done well from globalization is that kind of 80th to 90th percentile. So these are income deciles globally uh, on, the, on the horizontal axis here. And it's that kind of you know, top 20-ish percent, excluding maybe the top 5% or top 10% that has really struggled on a relative basis. That's globally. That is essentially the broad base of the middle class in the US and other developed economies. That's the group that has borne the pain, if you will, of all of the displacement and churn caused by globalization. And that's the group that's really driven the backlash we've seen over the last you know, five or seven years, 10 years, in terms of the rise of populism and a, and a lack of willingness to continue to underwrite globalization. Um, another view on this is looking at the divergence of elite uh, interests versus the interests of the general, general population. So I found this really interesting um, chart to look at how the World Economic Forum, uh, you can call that the Davos crowd, so global business uh, and international opinion leaders, they do annual surveys every year of what are the urgent and pressing concerns um, that we should all be thinking about for business and political leaders. And you know the lists evolve a little bit year over year, but broadly, if you look over the last kind of four or five years, this is a good representation of what it looks like. Very heavy focus on environmental issues, on climate change, and lots of different factors that uh, contribute to that. And then if you go a little bit farther down the list, uh, you start to see things like cyber attacks, um, privacy, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, data security issues, uh, global information infrastructure, a little bit of geopolitical, uh, that's the light blue one there, but it's largely around the success of institutions. If you then look at the right side of this page and you talk to the broad base of populations, and this is an aggregation of a, several different public opinion surveys in I think 15 different markets. Uh, so it includes developed markets in the US and Europe, uh, but also emerging markets like India. And if you ask what's on the minds as the most important and pressing issues for the citizenry in those countries, you just get a very different list. So I, I've at least found this um, you know, an eye-opening view into the disconnect perhaps between what's on the minds of global opinion leaders and business leaders and what the public uh, in those countries are, are thinking about and worried about. So if we continue on then to what might a world where there isn't as much support for, for globalization look like, uh, you know, I'd, I'd point to maybe three major themes uh, to, to talk about. Uh, you know, the first is greater geopolitical fragmentation and perhaps the rise of either softer or harder uh, organized trade uh, and, and kind of defense oriented blocks. So one of the questions that comes up a lot is, are we gonna enter a new Cold War? Is it the US versus China? Uh, and how rigid might those uh, alliances be? Um, you know, I do think there's a scenario here where there is a US-centered block that has both a shared set of commercial interests as well as ideological and values uh, alignment and a China-oriented block much more organized around mutual commercial interests and transactional relationships. So that's one scenario. There are, there are other flavors of that. Um, you know, there could be uh, a large non-aligned block uh, that comes into being as well. One interesting question is, does Europe continue to maintain cohesion in the EU? And if so, is that naturally a part of a US-oriented bloc? Or are there some incentives for various countries within Europe to maybe make different choices? Um, but that's the first theme here. Uh, did somebody want to jump in with a question or comment? Okay, I thought I heard somebody maybe gonna jump in. Um, second major theme I'd highlight here is increased instability across Eurasia broadly. So Europe, uh, Africa, uh, the Asian continent uh, versus relative stability in the Americas. So I've talked a lot about US and China. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but just important to acknowledge that that's not the only potential axis of friction. Uh, so one really interesting question is what happens between China and Russia? Is there a natural confluence of Chinese and Russian interests, maybe in opposition to the US? Or does the fact that China has a tremendous need for resources 
beyond what could be supplied easily from the countries that are already, I'll call it loosely or maybe more tightly affiliated with China through things like the Belt and Road Initiative, does that cause them to look more expansively for other overseas markets and resource access? And if that happens, then the most obvious natural place for China to look for those resources is in Russia, in Siberia in particular. And does that actually cause a, a reconvergence of Russian interests with the West perhaps in response to a perceived threat from China? So these are all unknowns. I think another big one there is uh, where does India uh, come down? Uh, you know, does India reprise a role that it played during the Cold War as a leader of the non-aligned movement? Or does it get more closely uh, affiliated perhaps with the US in response to growing threats from China? Or perhaps closer to China, given um, the rise of Chinese power and projection through the region? So some big questions there around just some of the great power dynamics, uh, particularly in Eurasia. Uh, and then the final point here is this notion, again, of just a rise in the level of ambient insecurity, an increased social priority for defense. And then the, you know, the related point to this is how does that ripple through in terms of greater tolerance or willingness to indulge a more powerful state? And so this, I think, is an interesting one that maybe doesn't get talked about as much, but in a world where you're already feeling more I'll call it defense-oriented insecurity. And now you have major issues or, or um, impacts like the economic crisis, uh, COVID, which is a public health emergency. Does this shift the willingness of public opinion in a country like the US or other countries in Europe to embrace a more powerful state? You know, you can look at some of the countries that have performed well in responding to COVID. Uh, there are a lot of different patterns we can talk about there. But in general, some of the models of stronger government response in East Asia in particular seem to have been successful. And does public opinion in the West start to look at those models? We already now have a much greater uh, hand of government just in the last three months with all of the support that's been put into the economy. And does this become a, a, a catalytic event that changes the willingness of, of people to accept uh, a much more interventionist role for the state? which by the way then triggers a much higher stakes battle for who are the policymakers who are gonna be writing the rules of that new order, which I think is one underlying driver of a lot of the political polarization we see in the US and other developed markets. People perceive that the stakes are higher because the power that goes to whoever writes the rules may be even greater. And we can come back and talk about that some more. Um, just a few more uh, initial kind of context setting comments. You know, I, I talked about the potential for blocks to arise. We did some work to try to look at how that might then affect the global trade environment. And, uh, you know, I, I think our general view on this was um, even in a world that is highly, you know, split and full of tension between, let's say, a China oriented block and a US oriented block, um, it's not like we're going to see a complete unwinding of global trade. Uh, and we'll probably need to look at this in terms of at least a few different levels of types of goods and services. Uh, you know, there will be a, a big category of lower tech goods and services, uh, including a lot of uh, natural resources, where it'll continue to be pretty free and open trade. And even during the height of the Cold War, you saw that with most commodity markets. Um, there might be a second or middle level with some levels of restriction. Uh, and that could be some consumer goods and services, financial services, higher value uh, industrial uh, components. But then there will be a, you know, a growing category of goods and services that around which trade and intellectual property protections are highly, highly restricted, uh, certainly across blocks and even to some extent within blocks. Uh, and this would be a lot of uh, advanced technology which is really the, the emerging axis of competition between China and the US. And, and so this is just a little bit of a conceptual view if you're running a business, part of the decision-making you need to think about if you're organizing a supply chain, for example, is that when and how quickly do I start to think about building additional sources of diversification for supply? When might I wanna bring sources of supply that are already in countries outside uh, what is likely to be an emerging block back closer to the block. And you know, there could be costs for moving too soon in terms of incurring additional uh, expenses and also costs for moving too slowly in terms of um, increased fragility. 
this US-China uh, axis, uh, you know, again, this was written before COVID, but I, I think I'd look at this page today and say, if anything, the contrast is even sharper and the stakes are even higher. Uh, you know, the US stance over the last few years has been a lot around leveling the playing field. Um, you know, the, the, the talk has been around the trade deficit, but I think the real goal underneath that was to maintain a US technological edge especially in dual use technologies with military applications where, where US policymakers are worried that that edge was eroding. Whereas from China, there's, there's an obvious imperative to sustain GDP growth as their workforce ages, as the limits of their investment and export led model become more clear, um, but also reducing reliance on foreign suppliers for technology. And you can look at the recent dispute around Huawei and the move by the US to, to choke off uh, access to important components that Huawei uses is a good example of what China is worried about. Again, underneath that, the, there's a longer term agenda for China to actually seek leadership in some of those emerging sectors that are gonna drive the next wave of, of global uh, growth. Um, we tried to look at what would happen in an extreme scenario where the US actually followed through on a desire to reshore a significant amount of the exports uh, and, and industrial base that's been moved over to China in recent decades. So this is a purely illustrative exercise. And you know, I, I'd say you could run a similar exercise for other developed markets in Europe, for example, but it's probably a more realistic option for the US uh, to do this if the political will is there, and that's obviously a huge if. But if you look at US direct imports from China, which is the $450 billion or so on this chart, and exclude some of the you know, final assembly in China where it's, it, you know, it's components imported from third countries, uh, strip out some of the lower value goods, which maybe will be seen as less strategic in nature. You could imagine a world where a significant chunk of uh, imports from China are able to be brought back over to the US, uh, you know, albeit with a massive investment required to support a move like this. Uh, and this would be very disruptive to supply chains for a period of time. You know, the, the rough uh, estimates we've done around what it would take to, to actually bring back that amount of, of manufacturing, it was in the order of several trillion dollars uh, of investment. Um, and it could create several million jobs uh, over time. Again, we'd have to make sure that we had the skill base or create those skills to do that. And so it would be very disruptive. It would be a, a kind of mobilization of US industry on a level that we really haven't seen since World War II. But I think our view was this is within the capacity of the US to absorb in terms of labor force and financial capacity. Um, it's not to say that this is uh, even a likely case, but a case that's got a non-zero probability and something we're thinking about if you're a manufacturer uh, in particular. And some of those jobs, by the way, would not be the manufacturing jobs themselves, but would be all the supporting construction and retooling of um, you know, infrastructure to, to support a reshoring of, of manufacturing on a reasonable scale. Um, you know, final point I think to highlight here, and this is maybe more for, for other countries who've been very export oriented. Um, you know, so these are, these are a handful of countries and the growth in um, you know, their wealth, certainly over time, and how they've ridden a very export oriented model to achieve that level of growth. Uh, so the Asian tigers in the you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, the clearest example, China more recently, you know, a question we often get asked is who's the next country to go down this path that China has of investment and export oriented growth. And I, you know, I think my general answer is it's not clear that there will be one, uh, at least in any grand scale, in part because of that reduction in willingness of the public uh, in the West to support the levels of investment that are required to, uh, uh, to enable that kind of growth model. Also in part because of the declining importance of labor costs in production. And so as, uh, as automation accelerates, uh, it will become more important to actually have production near sources of end demand. And so that favors developed markets who have big pools of wealthy consumers already versus the next set of emerging economies who can use this playbook of, uh, you know, export and investment led growth uh, to drive a wave of um, per capita growth uh, increase. So where could we land on all of this? What does this mean for people in, in different industries? 
uh, you know, I think our, our base assumption here would be that for, for kind of commodities uh, and raw materials, you know, those are going to largely be driven by uh, geographic ties, you know, where the commodities are, and, and probably not as much impact, even if we go into a world of blocks. Um, but there may, be, there may be real challenges to um, the free movement of goods uh, across borders in, a, in you know, a world like what I'm describing. Uh, you know, value added transformation. So I touched on this a minute ago. A smaller role for labor costs as a source of competitive advantage. An increase in automation. This is one of those where what we saw taking a decade to play out may happen in two or three years, depending on how aggressively people feel they need to respond to the challenges from COVID. And production moving closer to, uh, to end markets. Uh, and then finally, the rise in kind of experiential delivery. So this is more of a you know, what do you do if you're running a large company, particularly in a market with, uh, you know, more affluent customers? It increases the importance of consumer segmenting and targeting, um, but a recognition that along with a lot of these trends we've been talking about, there may be a doubling down of inequality, uh, and that's likely to provoke a more significant government uh, intervention in the economy again. Uh, final point here is just around changes from technology around innovations in logistics. And this notion again of people using more distance as the cost of that distance declines. I think I said final point, but I, I do want to hit one more, which is the other um, dimension to think about in all of this is we've all heard a lot in recent weeks and months about this debate between efficiency and resiliency. And one of the things I think that has been revealed from the COVID um, shock is that we've all taken advantage of this period of very benign macro conditions to really optimize every last bit of efficiency we can get out of, out of business. And now there's a recognition that maybe that pendulum has swung too far. Maybe we need to invest more collectively in resiliency, even at the cost of efficiency. And I think the debate that we see within companies and I think with, with political leaders as well right now is what, number one, how much Efficiency versus resiliency, are you willing to trade off? You know, where do you want to balance that? And then how is the best way to, to achieve that resiliency? And you can think about three different levers to achieve it. You know, one is to invest more in prediction. There's a lot of efforts that people are making right now to get a better crystal ball, a better view of where the world is going. And that's part of what, what I'm trying to do here a little bit with this talk. But at the same time, recognize that um, you know, it's impossible to have a perfect crystal ball. You can think about scenarios, but even there, you know, there's an almost an infinite range of scenarios. And so you also need to think about adaptability and how can I increase the speed and agility of responsiveness within my organization so that when my view of the future inevitably turns out to be wrong, I can adjust as needed. But then the final point really is true resiliency. What can you do to build more capacity, more buffers, better use of insurance and options and hedges to protect yourself against the inevitable scenario where a prediction is wrong and you can't adjust strategy fast enough. And I think this three-part kind of trade-off across prediction, adaptability, and resiliency will be an important dialogue that, that leaders will have to have over the coming years. And so maybe just to, 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 to leave that and go into general Q&A, the questions that, that we see businesses asking now are, you know, can I th th uh, thrive uh, in a world where global scale may not be as easy to, uh, to mobilize uh, as it was in the last few decades? You know, can my business help solve one of these emerging problems of scarce, uh, in particular, talent, you know, the right level of skills of talent? Um, am I a business that is relying on demand in particular from a big middle class, either in developed or developing markets, and what happens when that assumption and that middle class comes under pressure from this inequality trend? Am I in a business that is potentially in that you know, level three category where there could be a much higher level of political pressure on trade uh, and globalization? Uh, and then finally, how will the business fare in different interest rate environments? So we wrote this pre-COVID, where to be honest, we were assuming that this increase in automation uh, in response to um, tight labor would drive a surge in capital spending and that might actually drive interest rates higher. I think what we're now seeing, at least in the near term with COVID and governments you know, flooding economies with money, it's unlikely that we'll see high interest rates in the near term. In fact, we're likely to see 
you know, even lower rates for even longer. But in that scenario that I described where we do see a meaningful reshoring of manufacturing and the several trillion dollars of investment required to do that, that's the kind of thing that could be a catalyst for a rising interest rate environment. And so how will your business be positioned uh, in that kind of scenario? So I know that was a lot of ground to cover uh, and, and, and pretty rapidly, but um, happy, to, happy to pause now and take questions or comments from, um, from the group. Andrew, thank you. That was, that was great. Um, <clears throat> we, have, uh, we have about nearly 40 people, so there are a few questions. <laughs> Uh, so uh, one of the things I, I just wanted to uh, um, comment on, you, you talked about the sort of COVID change that COVID has driven. I was reading something uh, the other day, the CEO of um, uh, GitLab, um, he, he thinks that COVID in three months has accelerated remote working by a decade or maybe more. So we're seeing some very, very rapid change in a very short period of time. Um, Question from Scott. Um, can you go into more detail about how labor costs will be less of a competitive factor between nations? Uh, will reduced labor costs cease to be a major factor in offshoring of manufacturing? Yep. So the, um, you know, the thinking on, so the question is, you know, can you talk a little bit more about labor costs and how they'll contribute to total costs, let's say, and then how those might factor into decisions around offshoring? We did some work probably three or four years ago to really try to get at this automation question. And, and several other um, you know, analysts have, have done this as well from different angles. And you, know, you could look at the you know, percentage of different jobs that could be automated. Um, you can look at how that ripples out by industry and you know, can you really take away an entire position or part of a position. We looked at this from probably three or four different angles. You know, we also said if you automate what happens to uh, you know, demand, to, to, to price of, of the product, what happens to demand for the product. And however we came at it, we said that um, you know, you're likely to be able to get somewhere between 30 and 40% efficiency gains across most industries from automation, you know, service sector automation. And, and part of that was the technology, the core technology components are improving so quickly. So true service sector robotics, you know, there's like seven different systems you need to be able to design to have a low cost effective robot and they're all on very steep experience curves. Um, but then you also have things like this ubiquitous connectivity, which is enabling telemedicine. So we said there's a meaningful amount of stuff that can be automated. And so the point here was just if you do that and you drive that very hard, then, you know, labor becomes a lot less important as a, a, a cost component in whatever the good or service is that you're making. Um, you know, there's other big cost components like, um, you know, energy. So we did that work in 2016. It was right at a time when the U.S. Uh, shale revolution and fracking was really taking off. And so we said, the U.S. is liable to have an energy cost advantage and labor cost is becoming less important because of automation. It's not gonna make as much sense to send stuff over to China for labor arbitrage, ship it back to the U.S. versus making it in either the U.S. or in Mexico. And so that, that's really at kind of the, the heart of that trend. And then you can project that further, you know, in a world of 3D printing, where you can run at very small production lot sizes, you know, you could have your, your, your production, you know, much closer to end demand uh, to be able to innovate more rapidly uh, to reduce transportation and logistics costs. So th those were some of the general things that led us to this view that the model of you know, large pools of lower skilled, cheaper labor, shipping things long distances, you know, is gonna be less viable in addition to the kind of political support for it not being there. Got it. So, um, yeah, I, I can speak from personal experience. Um, I, I herniated a disc in my back and I've, I've barely seen a doctor. It's all been telemedicine. <laughs> and that, that was maybe before COVID, right? But now with COVID, it's, it's, it's again, ratcheting up. You're pulling a decade of progress into three months right. where people are innovating and figuring out a way to do a lot more telemedicine that they used to require an in-person visit for. Yeah, well, they could never figure out the billing with the insurance companies, but now they've had to. Lo and behold, it got done. <laughs> 
Um, okay, uh, question from Michael. What's the impact of demographics on the separate block formations and relative strengths? Yeah, so part of uh, the, this capital superabundance story was we tried to look at population pyramids and demographics across different countries around the world. And, you know, we just observed that uh, whenever you have a large share of your population in the kind of 45 to 60 year old age range, those are peak savers. Uh, those are people who are, you know, it, it's deflationary. You get a lot of capital formation, relatively less consumption versus either having a lot of young people or frankly, a lot of old people who are more in net consumption mode. And you can look at the kind of point in time at which different countries hit their you know, peak bulge of peak savers. So you know, Japan was one of the first countries to get there. I think it was like 2008. Uh, and then Germany, and you can see in different parts of Europe, you get into the periphery of Europe, it's happening you know, later and later. Um, now, some countries have a much younger population pyramid. So if you look at where global labor supply or potential workers could be added in the next decade, I think India alone is more than 100 million new workers. And it's more than you know, basically everybody else outside of Africa, let's say, combined. You know, the US was going to be in a position to add some modest amount of labor. Brazil uh, was going to be in a position to add some modest amount of labor. But China, Japan, you know, pretty much all of Europe are in net labor force contraction. Uh, you know, Africa, again, still labor supply growth, but the question there is, you know, will you be able to take advantage of it given these dynamics and kind of export led growth. So, um, you know, I, I think we would say, you know, India has very favorable demographics in the sense of younger, more dynamic population, at least potential workforce supply. You, you could view that more negatively if you're concerned about the ability to, to find jobs uh, for that size of population. The US is certainly in a much stronger relative position to Japan and, and Western Europe. And, and part of the kind of challenge in, within the EU is this different timing by which kind of Northern Europe versus Southern Europe ages. And so Germany will be, you know, broadly speaking, getting in a deflationary scenario before countries like Italy and Spain and Portugal will. And I think part of our concern, again, pre-COVID was this is going to exacerbate some of the natural tensions within the EU where Germany will want to tighten at a time the periphery wants to loosen. Now, again, that's been exacerbated with COVID, although maybe there's a newfound political willingness to take greater steps towards integration than there was without that crisis. And a sort of follow-on question, um, what, what country or, or um, business sector um, will surprisingly improve in 2020, do you think? <laughs> that crystal, magic crystal ball of yours, Andrew. I mean, 2020 is really hard to say uh, because <laughs> the range of outcomes, I think, on COVID are still so broad uh, right. in terms of, you know, will we be able to tamp down and, and control the disease aspects of it enough to normalize and reopen economies? I mean, I think that's still a big question in the U.S., which, you know, so far hasn't done a great job of it, I think it's fair to say. Um, you know, you go beyond 2020. So if I take the which businesses are going to be uh, well positioned here, I think the big, you know, technology, one thing we, I, I think as a consequence of this automation push, it is very positive for anybody in the technology industry and people who are supporting automation, supporting digitization, supporting some of these trends we've been talking about around working from home are getting a huge boost as well as companies with uh, you know, data-oriented business models, with logistics-oriented business models. So it's, it's maybe a bit of a cliche, but these big tech platforms, you know, the FANG companies in the US or the BAT companies in China, they've continued to pick up huge share at an accelerating rate. And, re and really the only constraint I think on that trend continuing is to what extent it provokes a government backlash as concerns arise that they've grown too powerful. But um, if you then translate that to a country view, you could look at the leading tech platforms globally, and they are almost all entirely in the US or China. And it's amazing to look at Europe as an economy that's still roughly the size of the US, 
and has virtually no really strong globalized tech platforms. Right. And so I think that's a huge source of uh, vulnerability for, for Europe. You talked about China. I think that there's been, we've got a number of questions here um, on, on China. Um, so the, my first observation is more, it's an observation rather than a question, is that I think people have woken up to the fact that they're not a benign actor. Um, whereas before there was a bit more of benefit of the doubt. Um, do, do you see, uh, you know, that the China model is unworkable? Um, you know, that the population is just too big and uh, for, for the resources that they need? Do you mean unworkable in a sense of for China to govern itself? Yeah, to, to, for China to, 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 to continue to pursue the existing policies given that they, they require resources from so many other parts of the world? Well, I think China has been trying to shift policies for several years now. So, you know, this model of what I've called uh, export and investment-led growth, which required them to, you know, keep interest rates low, to keep wage growth lagging, productivity growth, to control their currency. Like, they've been working to under uh, unwind that and move to a more balanced economy with more domestic consumption. You know, it's hard to do. And, uh, you know, if they pull it off, it'll be probably the largest scale version of that. Um, I mean, that's the model the U.S. pursued 100 years ago. So it's not unprecedented, but it'll be a pretty big, you know, feat if they're able to pull it off. Um, you know, there's also a perennial worry in China, I think, about just kind of political cohesion and stability given the country's history. And I think that's, you know, partly helped drive this turn towards more nationalism, um, towards a desire for greater kind of control by the party. And, and, and you know, there were certainly a lot of experts kind of predicting this 10 years ago. So I, I don't want to portray this as like a new thing. Um, and China's got, you know, big historical ambitions in a sense that, you know, for most of history, China was a leading power or the leading power. And it's the last, you know, couple hundred years that are the exception rather than the rule. So I think in any scenario that was going to put China on a collision course with the U.S. and the West. But to your point, you know, there's now a, 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 a gradual realization that the costs in particular on that kind of upper middle class in the West, you know, was a pretty high price to pay for globalization. And now a, a suddenly ratcheted up realization around vulnerability of supply chains um, through something like COVID that I think is, you know, partly going to catalyze this much, much more aggressive response that you're already starting to see in the U.S. Do, do you think other countries are going to be a backlash against China, particularly against the sort of Belt and Road initiatives that appear to be benign, but really are a, a bit of a debt trap? Well, I think you're already seeing that with other countries, although for any given country, it's going to be a constant kind of push-pull around how much they might like to have a backlash and, and how much they worry about angering China. Right. Uh, so Europe has, I think, a lot of the same incentives as the US, but probably less you know, bargaining power. And you've seen various different European countries be more accommodating of China than others. If you look closer to home in the region, that's where I think there's some really interesting choices facing countries like Vietnam, uh, the Philippines, you know, Malaysia, um, you know, even Singapore, which might be, you know, uh, from, a, from a value standpoint, a uh, desire to be closer aligned to the West, but it's very hard if you're in the immediate neighborhood to, to keep China fully at arm's length. Even Australia, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of debate around, um, you know, how much they can accommodate China um, versus obviously there's a, if you're going to draw a U.S. block, you know, Australia would be a core member of that from a kind of values and ideology standpoint. Um, but they have a much more tricky balancing act given their geography. Right. And, and so clearly we're looking at a sort of the, the friction between U.S. and China is rising. Um, Stephen's asking a, a more, slightly more specific question, how the U.S. is placed um, against China, you know, particularly with AI. Um, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a great question, and I don't, I don't pretend to be the deep expert on this topic, but from, from what I understand and, and you know, various conversations we've had and what we've researched on it, 
I think for now, the US still has a qualitative advantage in AI. Um, but China, you know, is rapidly catching up and is able to throw a lot of resources at kind of commercializing AI. So um, from a, a business building standpoint, if you say where are the next kind of big tech platforms going to come from, um, you know, China's got a lot of advantages in, in that race in terms of the, the size of kind of the entrepreneurial population, the base of engineering talent to tap into, and just the culture of the way those, those, those businesses are being built. Um, the U.S. you know, still probably has an advantage if you're looking for like the next big breakthrough in AI. And we have a lot of advantages as well around the ecosystem of Silicon Valley, which I think is you know, still unparalleled. But if you wanted to worry about something in the U.S., you'd say, you know, we've had a falling rate of true entrepreneurship and kind of new business formation for many years. And that kind of magic you know, secret sauce that, that has been a longstanding advantage of the U.S., um, you know, isn't as big of an advantage as it used to be. And so I think it, it's definitely something worth kind of keeping an eye on. I, I guess another aspect of this problem that people sometimes wonder about is the, you know, the amount of data that's required to drive leadership in AI. And does China have an advantage both because, you know, the size of the population and some of the platforms, as well as the willingness of companies and governments to use that data in a way that may be more regulated in the US. And I think that's a really interesting question because I think there's going to be one tension that says, you know, there's a growing awareness and a, con and, and a regulatory backlash and maybe a consumer backlash against privacy and the desire to more tightly control what tech platforms can do with data. On the one hand, that is going to collide with a little bit of a nationalistic worry that if we put too many shackles on US tech firms, it may make it harder for them to push the edge of the envelope uh, in competing with China around what you can do with AI. And so does that kind of consumerist privacy backlash trump the uh, national security instincts? You know, don't know, but that'll be something worth watching over the next few years. You talked about um, resiliency um, and uh, particularly brought to me, you know, supply chain. Um, I think that there's, uh, I think it was um, uh, Jaguar um, were not able to supply any cars because uh, they were they ran out of key fobs and their only only um, source was China <laughs> and they literally had about thirty or forty left and that was all they could, they could uh, they could supply so the entire yeah. car broke down because of key fobs coming from China. Um, I think it's going to drive people to source from multiple different countries rather than relying on the one source. Um, which countries do you see benefiting from that? Um, I, first of all, I agree with the I agree with the challenge. It was a great quote I heard recently from uh, Scott Gottlieb, the former head of the FDA. He was talking about COVID and the ability of you know countries to rapidly scale up testing. Uh, and his point was, it's not even some of the most technically challenging aspects of testing that were the problem in a country like the U.S. It was the extremely commoditized. Uh, you know, reagent kits and, you know, syringes and, uh, you know, his comment was your supply chain is only as good as the lowest margin component in it. And that's where I think in particular people have really emphasized efficiency over resiliency. So I think there is going to be a growing, uh, you know, realization that, that that can't continue. Which countries, you know, thrive on that? I, I think it'll depend a lot on the product. I mean, there's a lot of talk about production moving to Vietnam. Uh, you know, within, within Asia. A lot of that still goes through China in some way, shape, or form. I think there's a big movement to diversify into India. Uh, but then if you look at kind of U.S. pharmaceuticals that come from India today, I think a lot of them actually still come from China before they go through India. So it's going to be harder. I, I don't want to minimize the difficulties in really unwinding some of these very concentrated supply chains that have exposed people to over-reliance on China. But I think people are going to, you know, be working on that problem pretty aggressively. You know, where things can come back to the U.S. or to Mexico, now that we have a revised NAFTA, people will be looking at those options. Um, but that'll be a big, big challenge, uh, you know, depending on the industry. Great. Well, I think one more question. Uh, Wasim, you asked a question about um, 
reshoring manufacturing? Sure, sure. Um, so, so Simon, uh, so Andrew, this is fascinating. So thank you so much. Um, really learned a lot. Um, in, in terms of reshoring, right? Uh, and I, I've got to find my question now, Simon. <laughs> in terms you said of, reshoring manufacturing, how will the advances in robotics and AI right. affect this? Right, so that, that was a key issue there. And I think you, you addressed some of, those, some of those comments, but uh, as you start reshoring, um, and as we push for a more advanced robotic AI focused um, set of industry, uh, if you're reshoring, you know, how will that affect the, the workforce, right? So, I mean, what kind of jobs will they have uh, in this space? Because right? you've got two different tensions at the same time. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think you're right. On the one hand, you have this automation which could displace a lot of jobs. On the other hand, you still have critical skill shortages for some of these new jobs of the future. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess to the first part of your question, you could imagine reshoring of a lot of the activity without nearly as many jobs coming back, in part because people will be relying much more on automation and AI and robotics. And, and a lot of the jobs may frankly be in things like construction. If you think about retooling the spaces where all this uh, manufacturing is going to happen or infrastructure build outs. Um, but beyond that, I think we do still have a skill gap. And so there, there is this tension where, you know, we're, we're trying to adjust and pull forward automation, but we have to make a major kind of reskilling investment in the workforce. And I think that the question there is, is maybe what role does the corporate sector play versus, uh, you know, call it the public sector and educational policy. Does the U.S. start to embrace more of a vocational tech and, you know, apprenticeship training model like they have in Germany, for example? Do companies, um, you know, one way in which this more interventionist role of government could play out is a mandate for companies who are going to be going through big layoffs to invest in reskilling their workforces or contributing to funds that do that. And that's not that far-fetched. You, know, you already saw the state of New Jersey before COVID impose what was basically a mass layoff tax. Uh, and so I think you could see more and more of those things as, as people become aware of this urgent need to upgrade the skill base of the workforce. That's great. Well, we're at the hour point, Andrew, and I think we, um, you know, this has been fantastic. Really appreciate you sparing the time to, to share your insights with us. Um, we've covered an awful lot of ground, that's for sure. Um, so, and we seem to have answered most of the most of the questions that came through. So, at this point, um, I'd like to just sort of wrap the uh, the, the formal part of this meeting up. Um, Wasim and I would like to sort of take this into more of a Boston chapter um, meeting. Everyone is more than happy to stay. Um, but uh, I just want to thank you, Andrew, for, for a tremendous presentation. Great. Well, thank you all. Um, enjoyed it. And um, if there are follow-up questions uh, and you want to get those through Simon or Rasim, happy to, happy to, to engage in those as well. Yeah, absolutely. Please send along to or either of us and we'll, we'll pass them on. Yeah. All right. Great. You know there's going to be lots. <laughs> <laughs> thank Thanks you so all. Much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. Bye.